Now, heavy clashes with militants in Cumbri commune. Yatenga, northern Burkina Faso, has left about 17 soldiers and 36 volunteer fighters dead. The army said that the unit had been deployed to the town to help the resettlement of residents forced out of the area by the jihadists more than two years ago. There are more details of what transpired uh, in this package. Burkina Faso has been a focal point of instability and insecurity in Africa as a military takeover of the government has failed to bring stability to the nation. In the most recent attack on government forces, more than 50 Burkina soldiers and volunteers were killed in clashes. This has come in the wake of the country's agreement with the Russian government for the improvement of its security architecture. The rising violence in the West African nation has driven its refugees to neighboring countries. The attack in northern Burkina Faso has been linked to rebels in the country and the government has maintained its position to fight them headlong while seeking its support of its foreign allies. As the Burkina government attempts to resettle its citizens sent out of their homes by rebels more than two years ago, it faces a relentless enemy in terrorists lurking around the country. Now, joining me tonight on Secure the Continent is Dr. Chris Quadra, who's also a professor of international relations and strategic studies and member of the United Nations Working Group of Mercenaries. He joins us live from the nation's capital, Abuja. I also have Fahira Rodriguez Corne, Sahel Project Manager, Institute for Security Studies, joining me live from Bako in Mali, and also Dr. Nassan Wadarako. Research Fellow at the Center for Democracy and Development, joining me live from Niger's capital, Abuja. A warm welcome to you, gentlemen, and thanks for joining me on Secure the Continent. I'd like to start with Dr. Uh, Lassan Wadarago. Uh, can you give us a context and background to how we got here in the first place? How did Burkina Faso go from being spared most of the jihadist attacks in the Sahel to the epicenter? in less than a decade? Um, first of all, I would like uh, to join my voice to the voices of, uh, you know, several people who are today mourning the loss of life in Burkina Faso, but also in Mali and uh, broadly in our region uh, due to uh, terrorist attacks, which, um, you know, unfortunately we have seen increasing uh, more and more recently. Um, over the past few years, the situation in Burkina Faso has continued to uh, disintegrate, but uh, uh, one of the things that we have also observed is that the new regime is uh, upfront. Uh, they're not locking themselves in the barracks and waiting for the enemy to come. There is a confrontation between our armies and uh, and and the uh, insurgents the terrorists and so there's a fight going on and when there's a fight going on uh casualties um among the military and uh, civilians are bound to happen and today unfortunately we are we are mourning the loss of uh of several um, dozens of, uh, of lives lost but how did we get where we are it's really difficult to summarize a decade long of history but um this uh you know, insurgency uh, or this terrorism in Burkina Faso and the wider Sahel zone, if we are to to seek to understand how it, it happened, we need to go back to the, you know, the fall of Libya and then uh, mm -hmm. the crisis in northern Mali and how our states, our fragile states, have not been able to contain all of those crises. And then today, unfortunately, we are uh, at a level where the, the, the situation is very, very serious. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wadarago, uh, for that introduction. Now I'd like to bring in, uh, uh, I'd like to bring in Fireman Rodrigo Kone into the conversation. Now, Fireman, uh, the loss of 53 security force members is a huge number. And uh, that was what we saw in the recent clashes. Uh, Fire, um, Dr. Wadarago did mention that, you know, the new regime on the Captain Ibrahim Traore is more upfront. 
and they're not just sitting in the barracks, they're confronting uh, this uh, extremist head on. So what could have contributed to the significant loss of uh, this security forces members and how might it impact future operations or is it just I mean, when you have a situation where there's a conflict, is it bound to happen? Okay, we seem to have some technical issues with Fireman, but I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Kwaja into the conversation. Uh, now, Dr. Kwaja, would you like me to repeat the question or did you get it? Hello, Dr. Kwaja, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, go I ahead. I think the, the situation in Burkina Faso presents a real security challenge for both Burkina Faso, the Sahel, and Africa. And I think for me, we need to understand and appreciate the fact that the death of these 53 soldiers should not be placed far and above the death of hundreds of Burkina citizens that were killed as a result of the activities of armed groups in Burkina Faso, as well as the deadly confrontation between these armed groups and the government of Burkina Faso. And the question will be for me, since the demise of the French troop. What has happened to Burkina Faso? We now have a new security infrastructure that is defined along the path of the emergence of the Russian supported Wagner group. We've seen in recent times conversations going on between the new military junta in. Burkina Faso and the government of Russia. So in the last one month, what has happened in the context of overhauling the security architecture of Burkina Faso to ensure that the government of Burkina Faso is able to effectively contain the activities of rebel groups. And I think for me, that is where the conversation should be. Because in looking at or undertaking a gap analysis around the deployment of force to deal with this situation, we are now confronted with the death of these soldiers. So it is far beyond what the Russians, I mean, what the French troop did, far beyond what the government of Burkina Faso itself is doing or what the Wagner group has and a third party in the conflict that was invited to come in has done, we need to undertake a holistic diagnosis of the situation. And I think for me, that is where the conversation should begin. And what we've seen is that Burkina Faso is engaging the government of Russia, and this engagement can take two forms. The first is to consolidate on what the Wagner Group has done, and second is a government-to-government -government relationship in the context of the kind of cooperative agreement that the government of Burkina Faso and the Russian government will sign. But we also need to place on the table the fact that the African Union itself is right now having, and since 1977, we've had the OAU Convention on Mercenaries that was enacted in 1977, which abolished the use of mercenaries. The AU Framework on Security Sector Reform itself also cautions states from using private military and security companies in the context of both combat as well as security sector reform work in their countries. And right now, we are not clear about the nature of cooperative agreement that will be entered between the government of Burkina Faso and Russia. And I think for me, that is where the African Union and the international community should come in, looking at what the agreement looked like in the context of 
who is going to do what, the kind of weapons needed, the kind of trainings that should be will be given, and where it places the government of Burkina Faso in the context of how the security situation in Burkina Faso will impact both on national security as well as regional security within the broader Sahel and West Africa. Thank you, Dr. Kwaja. I'd like to bring back uh, Dr. Wadarago into the conversation. Now, Dr. Wadarago, uh, there were two coups in the last uh, less than 24 uh, months. And one of the results, uh, one, one of the reasons why this coups happen is, you know, to improve the security situation. Uh, you had uh, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Paul Demiba that was ousted by uh, Captain Ibrahim Traore. But it seems the security situation is not improved. Dr. Kwanja did mention uh, some type of military cooperation with Russia and the Wagner Group. Uh, could you state, uh, for the sake of our viewers, what is the current state of military cooperation? I uh, do understand that, left, uh, that Captain Traore was in Russia uh, and met with Russian senior military officials to have a sort of military cooperation deal. Are there Wagner uh, mercenaries on the ground in Burkina Faso? Are Russian uh, military trainers involved in any way in tackling uh, the insurgency and the violent extremism in Burkina Faso as we speak? Well, I would like to state without any equivoque in response to Dr. Kwajo's um, analysis that in Burkina Faso, we shouldn't make any confusion. In Burkina Faso, there is no Wagner operating in Burkina. And uh, in the analysis, sometimes we tend to conflate um, having a bilateral relation with Russia and having a relation with Wagner. And I think these are two completely different issues. Of course, Burkina Faso had had issues with uh, uh, its long time uh, partner, which is France, and had demanded that the French military base be dismantled and, and the French had agreed and, and had left. And uh, what I need to add on that is that Burkina Faso had a, a, a bilateral relation with uh, Russia since 1967. And the current government is just going back to the Russians and saying, look, we, we had this going on since 1967, and today we are in trouble. Uh, in what ways can you assist us? And that assistance is defined in terms of uh, you know, access to weaponry, but also access to military training. And during the recent uh, visit of the Russian uh, military officers in Burkina Faso, they have discussed widely about uh, uh, sending Burkina military to Russia to receive training, including uh, training in, in, in you know, uh, pilot training and, uh, you know, how to maneuver uh, things like drones and so on and so forth. There has not been any discussion whatsoever in terms of bringing Russians to Burkina, let alone bringing Wagner. Because one thing that most people do not know is that the opposition against uh, foreign military on the continent is not necessarily coming from the government alone. It is also coming from our traditional chiefs. Our, if you take the Moronaba, who is the traditional leader of the Mosi people, the majority community in Burkina Faso, they are completely against the presence of, uh, the presence of foreign military in the country. And even when the French were in Burkina, they were not allowed to really deploy on the ground and fight because the Mosi were opposed to them, to, to them being on the, on the, on the, uh, having boots on the ground. So, um, so when, when we're looking at uh, you know, the ways in which the situation has, uh, has gone from the time when we had uh, Kabore to the time when we had President Damiba to President Kabor, uh, Traore now, of course, um, if we're to look at how the, the conflict has intensified, if you have to look at how the number of victims, uh, and whether it's on the civilian side or on the military side, has increased, we might tend to think that, oh, the, the you know, Burkina Faso is disintegrating, is falling apart. But as a matter of fact, these are zones where the terrorists have been occupying since 2015, 2016. We know they are there, but we dare not go. The local communities have displaced. 
And now the current government is trying to bring communities back into the villages. So clashing is bound to happen, and that is sadly what we're seeing today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wadarago. I just want to confirm if we've established, uh, re-established communication uh, with Fireman uh, Rodrigo Kone, I believe we haven't. Uh, now, uh, back to you, uh, Dr. Kwaja. Uh, we've, we've seen this uh, insurgency in Burkina Faso uh, rage on uh, for quite a number of years. And there's a saying in Africa that if your neighbor's house is on fire, you don't go to sleep. Uh, how much effort has ECOWAS, the regional body, uh, the African Union uh, put to support Burkina Faso, uh, especially since the departure of the French, uh, into addressing the ex violent extremism uh, in Burkina Faso? Because we, we always seem to hear the voice of ECOWAS uh, when there's a coup and uh, they don't, they're not, they're not very active and uh, aggressive in, in tackling or, or caring about this situation. Uh, fellow brothers in Burkina Faso are going through. So what's your response to that? Are there any current regional efforts ongoing to address uh, the issue of violent extremism in Burkina Faso? Uh, the situation in Burkina Faso is uh, quite interesting. And I want to go back uh, to the point my uh, dear friend raised about the fact that the Wagner group is not present in Burkina Faso. And any researcher, policy analyst, who understands the politics of the Sahel in the context of what is happening in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, knows clearly that you are dealing with a triangle. And there is no one part of that triangle that will be on fire that will not affect the other two because of the nature and fluidity of the rebel groups within the Sahel. And the presence of Mali within that stretch, I mean, the presence of the, the Wagner group within that stretch is to a large extent impacting on the security situation in Burkina Faso. And secondly, my point about the kind of cooperative agreement going on between the government of Burkina Faso and Russia is also hinged on the two components I drew attention to, the government-to-government -government relationship as well as the government-to-mercenary or private military and security company relationship. And I still stand by that, that this kind of relation relationships might occur in a way that even the local chiefs that he talked about might not understand or even know because it might be happening at a very covert and opaque manner in ways that only those that are at the strategic level in the security architecture will understand. Now, on the part of ECOWAS, it's quite unfortunate that the situation in the Sahel, not just about Burkina Faso happened in a way that caught ECOWAS becoming more reactive rather than proactive. And what we have seen in Burkina Faso, in Mali and Guinea is a breakdown of the ECOWAS early warning system. Because before these things happened, ECOWAS should have been able to pick some of those signposts and respond to them. But we were left with a situation where the coups happened before ECOWAS had to come in and suspend, giving directives for the junters to relinquish power. Apart from Cape Verde, under Obasanjo in Nigeria, where he was able to frontally engage the coupies. We've not seen any country where coup plotters plotted a coup, succeeded, and they were asked to just relinquish power and leave. It has not happened in West Africa. So when ECOWAS mentioned that, 
Some of us knew it will not happen. We expected a more proactive response in terms of engagement with them, in terms of imposing strict sanctions that will get them to begin to design a Marshall Plan, a Marshall plan for this engagement from the political scene. Just the way we are saying uh, uh, in, 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 in Niger today. Thank you very much for clarifying things, Dr. Kwaja. I'm afraid uh, we have to go on a quick break at this point. We'll continue our conversation on the situation, uh, sadly deteriorating security situation in Burkina Faso when we return from this break. Do stay with us. You're watching Secure the Continent on New Central Television. Welcome back to Secure the Continent and New Central Television. If you've just joined us, we've been discussing uh, the deteriorating situation in Burkina Faso, where about 53 security uh, operatives were killed in the past one week uh, by violent extremists. And uh, joining us uh, this evening for this all important discussion is Dr. Chris Kwaja, who's an associate professor of international relations and strategic studies, a member of the United Nations Working Group and Mercenaries. Also have Fireman Rodrigo Cone, Sahel, a project manager at the Institute of Security Studies, who's joining us live from Bamako in Mali. And also Dr. Asane Wadurago, research fellow at the Center for Democracy and Development, Nabuja Wom. Welcome back, gentlemen, and thanks for staying with us. Now I'd like to begin the second half with uh, Fireman Rodrigo Cone in Bamako. Uh, volunteer defense forces play a crucial role in Burkina Faso's uh, security efforts. Uh, Firemen, could you provide examples of the contributions and the unique challenges they face and uh, the involvement of uh, volunteer defense uh, personnel? Is it an admission of the lack of strength in the Burkina Bay regular army? Is it a desperate measure? Or are their efforts consolidatory? Frankly, it's really difficult to hear uh, the question. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, uh, Dr. Wadrago, I would just like to direct that question. Uh, that I did ask uh, Fireman to you. We seem to have some audio connect disc uh, audio issues uh, with him. Uh, talking about the volunteer defence forces, uh, they've suffered quite a lot of casualties. Critics have said the Burkina Bay Army is using them as a buffer. Uh, what role do they play in Burkina Faso security efforts and architecture? And uh, could you provide examples of the contribution? and some of the challenges they face in dealing with violence extremism in Burkina Faso. So this war against the violent extremist organizations in Burkina Faso, as you know, is, an, uh, is not a conventional war. And uh, the terrorists are, um, are not coming in as uh, you know, conventional soldiers and standing and fighting us. They are coming in at night, they are hiding in our communities and, uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea of deploying uh, community security agents or community volunteers is, first of all, to expand and, and uh, increase the potential of the army and you know Burkina Faso did not have a large army it's one of the smallest armies actually in the region prior to this uh, conflict so in terms of numbers we could not be everywhere around the 270,000 square kilometers that's one point secondly uh, the volunteers for the defense of the patri or the fatherland their primary role is not to be in the forefront and 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 fighting the um you know the terrorists but instead when the military arrived at securitizing a zone you always need a security personnel to stay there to stay put to allow uh, community members to return to their villages 
And that's the primary fundamental role that uh, uh, these volunteers are playing. So, um, and there are two levels. It's one first level that um, some of them are recruited at the national level, meaning they can join the military and go fight anywhere. Some of them are also recruited at just at the local level. They're not allowed to go beyond their own community. So they are trained and kept within their own community. And when the military is able to securitize the zone, that's when they are called in to back up, to, to, to save guard, to keep guard and allow uh, community members to come back in. So, and, and usually when they are keeping guard, and uh, they're also keeping guard with uh, a small number of military because they are not left alone. And that is exactly what happened on Monday. Um, you know, they were keeping guard and they were being uh, supported by a small number of military personnel. And unfortunately, they met this fate. So um, when we hear about uh, the volunteers for the defense of the patriot, outside of Burkina Faso, it's usually wrongly perceived as a militia. But these are people who are defending their farms. These are people who are saying, look, um, if the military is able to come here and, and, and fight them out, we would like to be able to, to stay. We are also men. We're not going to run away. We're going to stay and protect our farms. We are going to stay and protect our cattle. We are going to stay and protect our families. So it's... Um, and, and this is an idea that has been brewing long time ago. And even before the VDP were adopted as a, as a, a security measure, um, we have the Kolwego, we have the Dojo, we have many other community level vigilante group that were working. So, and, and the government did not even need to ask people to do that. And so the VDP is just, uh, away from the government to sort of officialize and train them and make sure that we do not see or witness any um, abuse that may come with uh, handling weapons. Thank you, so, uh, Dr. Wadurago. Fireman Rodrigo Kone in Bamako. Uh, could you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, dearly, but I can hear you. Okay, right I will now. try to make I myself very audible because it's very important. Uh, we get your contribution on the program tonight. And that fireman, drawing from global experiences, what are some lessons Burkina Faso can learn about effectively integrating volunteer defense forces into its security apparatus? Because in Nigeria, when the Nigerian army in the heydays of Boko Haram, we did have uh, the civilian joint task force. Uh, what's the best way to go about uh, this approach of having, you know, ordinary citizens of the country who feel they have a responsibility to defend the territorial integrity of the country? Uh, how, what's the best approach to engaging them and not also using them as cannon folder? What's the best uh, approach in, in this? And what do you make of uh, this sort of uh, hybrid uh, response of having your regular army and also uh, volunteer security uh, forces fighting side by side? Uh, yes, as uh, my predecessor has mentioned, uh, this uh, strategy of uh, mobilizing community uh, uh, members, uh, VDP, uh, to fight wars is uh, 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 historically and rooted in a uh, security apparatus of uh, Burkina Faso. We have to re remember under uh, uh, Thomas Sankara, uh, uh, the, the CDR, uh, there were like volunteers also, uh, but now uh, in the strategy, the, the, the government is, is trying to multiply uh, forces uh, by mobilizing young in, the, in, the, in those communities. Uh, uh, but the problem about that is, is now uh, the jihadist groups, uh, are recruiting among communities too. So uh, now uh, the, the, the community volunteers are becoming, and the community themselves are becoming like a military target for those jihadist groups. And uh, at, at the same time, 
uh, the, the, the numbers of days that those volunteers are trained is not sufficient, it's only two weeks. And they, they have weapons. And at the same time, uh, inside the army, uh, there is a limited equipment for uh, the, the, the soldiers. So the strategy in, in itself, the idea is, is, a, is a good idea, but practically in a way of uh, putting in a, I can say in an operational way, there, is, there are some problems which should be fixed in order to make a, a, a performance uh, of this uh, uh, strategy. Thank you very much, uh, Fireman, uh, for your contribution. Uh, now, uh, back to you, Dr. Kwaja. Uh, we're looking at uh, the current situation uh, in Burkina Faso, because it, it seems it's just getting terrible every other day. There's uh, reports of uh, violence, extremism in, in different parts of the country. Now, looking ahead, uh, looking at the bigger picture, what could the prolonged conflict uh, cause uh, a humanitarian crisis and political instability uh, mean for Burkina Faso's future stability and development? And uh, are, is it still a situation where that can be salvaged? And why does it seem that the world is not giving it the attention it deserves? We have uh, three sides to the future of Burkina Faso in the context of the prevailing situation we are dealing with. The first is governance. Governance in the context of the fact that since the present military junta came into power on the basis of this very simple logic and assumption that it had all it takes to reclaim the statehood of Burkina Faso in the context of reasserting its power over the control of the instruments of coercion, then it must do that. If it's not able to do that, it is also giving room for public discontent, and this discontent might also lead to another round of possibly coup, cool, we don't pray for that, or political turmoil in Burkina Faso. The second is humanitarian. Humanitarian in the context of the fact that when you have the government of Burkina Faso and rebel groups in armed confrontation, the people suffer in terms of death, in terms of forced displacement of people from their places of abode, in terms of dislocation of people from their sources of livelihood. And this humanitarian crisis will generate a huge existential challenge, both for the people of Burkina Faso in the context of human security and the government of Burkina Faso in the context of national security. The third pillar is the regional implication of the crisis in Burkina Faso. And this regional implication can be seen along three key pillars. The first pillar is the Sahel. Countries within the Sahel. The second is the broader West African region. And the third is North Africa, because of the proximity of Burkina Faso to the Sahara and up north within the North African uh, region. Now, this on its own creates a real security dilemma that I see, and that this dilemma requires both a G5 Sahel and ECOWAS an African Union and United Nations proactive response in the context of looking at how best to effectively deal with the current security situation. Now, from the perspective of transition, the key question for me is, 
how do we put in place a transition program that leads to a credible election that produces leaders that will be up and doing in terms of their primary responsibilities of governing the people of Burkina Faso in a way that gives every citizen a sense of belonging. And the second is how do we ensure that from the perspective of fragility, the government is able to muzzle all it takes to effectively assert itself as a government. And one of the primary feature of a government is not about population. It's not about its ability to manage the economy, but it's about its ability to protect the people, give them hope, restore, restore strength and courage in the context of public safety. That for me is what I see as some of the critical pathways for Burkina Faso. And these critical pathways I've identified are also templates that we can use for Mali, for Guinea, for Niger, and even Chad that we see of recent. And the latest in the book is okay. Gabon. And Thank I think for, for me, the, the lessons learned along this path is that even for those countries that are yet or have not experienced what we have seen, they need to really take time to reflect inwardly around what they are doing when it comes to leadership and how public discontent is beginning to create a siege mentality in the minds and hearts of people to the extent mm. that I, they begin the, to see military, the return of the military as a viable option. Thank you very much, Dr. Panja, and I like the point where you left off there. It should be about the people. Now, uh, Dr. Wadurago, talking about the people, we can't have this discussion without talking about the impact of this violence extremism on the ordinary Burkina base, who are the most important factor in all of this. The influx of displaced people seeking safety in urban areas uh, poses its own set of challenges uh, for the central government in Ouagadougou. How are host communities coping with the increased population and demands for services? And what assistance uh, is the government uh, providing uh, for these people to support them? Well, today, if you're living in Ouagadougou, uh, Bobojo Lasso, which is the second largest city of Burkina Faso, there is barely anyone in those two major cities who do not have a relative that has been impacted by the crisis one way or the other. So not everybody goes to a, a you know a refugee camp. Most people will go to relatives' homes, and uh, so we we have to pull in resources and uh, you know support those um, fellow family members. So the humanitarian situation is. Um, um, really uh, complex and uh, I would say dire today, but sadly um, Burkina is still not a priority when we when we are discussing the conflict. We are always looking at uh, the simple fact that it's a country ruled by a military regime and we fail to comprehend that the military are in power, but the situation is not getting better you know, what are the perspective for elections and so on and so forth. Um, so, and, and we often forget that the situation that we have here, having a military regime is the consequence of the insecurity in the first place. And that equation is often quickly forgotten that the, the insecurity does not precede, uh, it came before the military took over. The military did not take over, and then we have insecurity. So, and 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 when the debate are all about democracy and uh, you know uh, ending, moving toward the end of the transition, we forget the very people who are the first victims of uh, this insecurity situation, which are the people of Burkina Faso. People are extremely resilient in the ways in which they cope with the situation, but to what extent can you be resilient? This has been going on for 
eight years, nine years? And how long can we keep being resilient? We just have to maintain hope and uh, hoping for the best that uh, the, the, the regime, the military and the VDP who are fighting will eventually be able to reduce uh, you know, the insecurity and drive them out to some extent so that we can also return to some sort of a normalcy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Udrago. Best wishes uh, with the people of Burkina Faso who have been going through this violence extremism uh, for a number of years now. I'd like to say a big thank you to our panelists. Uh, Dr. Chris Kwaja, Associate Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies and a member of the United Nations Working Group of Mercenaries. And also Fireman Rodrigo Kone, Sahel Project Manager of the Institute of Security Studies, uh, who joined us live from Barako in Mali. And also Dr. Lasan Wadarago, Research Fellow, Center for Democracy and Development in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. It was a pleasure having you all join me tonight on Secure the Continent. I do appreciate your contribution. Now, to Thank you. you. You're welcome. Now, to effectively combat violent extremism in Burkina Faso, the government should focus on strengthening security forces, promoting socio-economic development, engaging communities, countering extremist propaganda, enhancing international cooperation, improving governance, and the rule of law, implementing rehabilitation and reintegration programs, and also addressing regional st instability. This multifaceted approach aims to address root causes, enhance security measures, foster community resilience, and promote inclusive development, ultimately, walking towards the eradication of violent extremism in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, for being a part of today's program. But remember to stay safe and alert at all times. I am Benga Aburua. See you next week. Bye-bye.